This is episode number 19 featuring artist Joe McGurl. Welcome to the Plen Air Podcast from Plen Air Magazine. I am your host, publisher, Eric Rhodes, founder of Plen Air Magazine. In the Plen Air Podcast, we dive into the world of outdoor painting. We call it Plen Air Painting. For those who don't know, Plen Air is a French term, which basically means going outside. So we are going outside to paint. The French pronounce it Plen Air. Others pronounce it Plain Air. But whatever you call it, there's a huge movement of artists around the world going outside to paint. And this show is all about the movement. This week's podcast is brought to you by the Plen Air Convention next April, which is already over 60% sold out. Hard to believe this far in advance. It's the world's largest Plen Air event. It is my desire to see more people fall in love with Plen Air painting. And you can help by sharing this podcast with your friends on social media, email, etc. I hope you'll subscribe to it so it comes to you every single week. And if you have feedback, reach me, eric at plenairmagazine.com. Today's interview brought to you by easelbrushclip.com. Seeing more and more and more of them out there. Let's get right to our interview with artist Joe McGurl. Hey, Joe. Hi, Eric. I'm glad to be here, and thanks for inviting me, and hello to everybody who's listening, too. Well, hello back. So um, a lot of people listening. I think this is up to about close to 50,000 people now, and um, so... You're going to have to say hello to each one individually. I guess this is a good time to get started. <laughs> Be worse than those college graduations then, huh? <laughs> so, oh yeah, standing in line waiting for all the diplomas. Yeah. Yeah, you just went through that. The, your son just graduated, is that right? Yes. Yeah, he's a musician. Oh, I And now so. he's in the real world of trying to make a living as a musician in New York City. Well, that's the world that you had to figure out as well. How how did you figure that out? We'll we'll get into your history in a minute, but um, well, actually, let's just go ahead and start with the history, and then I'd like to talk about eventually how you figured out how to make a living as an artist, which is not an easy thing to do. How did this whole painting thing and, and art thing begin for you? Well, my dad was a an artist. He didn't do uh, easel paintings like I do. He did uh, more decorative painting and uh, a lot of murals. Um, He was kind of a jack of all trades and he was a really great inspiration because he worked for a a company that uh, painted the interiors of churches back in the 1950s and the early 60s. And that's when there was still a lot of decoration going on. But then eventually he wanted to strike it on his own. So he just started painting murals and, uh, you know, getting little jobs, painting murals. And um, he designed monuments. He did uh, uh, did some easel painting. Uh, he did gold leafing, stenciling. So anything he could do with paint, he did. He was really, a, a, or he still is, a smart guy and uh, a really great role model on how to make a living as a self-employed person. He was a tireless worker. What is your dad's name? James. James McGurl. James McGurl, and is he still doing art today? Uh, no, he's he's eighty seven, retired. He every now and then he'll do little projects and such. Uh-huh. By and large, he's pretty much retired. So, when you were little, um, was he putting brush in hand and teaching you technique, or was that something that that you had to learn on your own? Yeah, he was. He, he taught me, you know, most of what I know. I learned from him, um, and a lot of it was on the job training all through high school and college. And a little while after, I worked with him. And um, during those years, he was doing a lot of murals and a lot of it in like restaurants or churches and public buildings and such. So you were going in and working with him painting murals? Yeah. Yeah. And, and did he uh, did he sketch it out and then you filled it in or did he just say, here, go at it? Uh, it started out, he sketched it out and he'd give me a roller and a pan and I'd be rolling the big areas like the skies or the backgrounds and as i got older and more competent i was you know just sort of naturally gravitated towards doing more complex parts of the mural and then in the end i was you know painting kind of alongside him doing figures and detail and things like that so it just sort of progressed as as i got better 
So I'm curious. I'm curious about that because I I know that painting uh, frescoes is an entirely different proce- process. If you're painting a mural for indoors, uh, is, is it the same as painting? You, you're not using oil paint, I assume. No, usually we would use latex. Sometimes we used oil, but the oil paint was shiny. You don't really want a shiny surface indoors because if you were in a restaurant, for instance, all the lighting would be shining off the mural. Right. So we'd use like a flat latex paint or acrylic. And what would you do outdoors or did you do outdoor murals? Yeah, we did some outdoor murals and uh, sign painting and things like that also. And that would be oil usually. In those days, especially the latex wasn't uh, nearly as durable and the oil was, you know, much better quality than it is today. So did so, you, did you, um, your, your education came primarily from your father. At some point, did you go to art school or study under one in particular other than your father? Yeah. I, well, when I was a kid, I went to the Museum of Fine Arts for art classes on Saturdays. And there was a teacher there, Ralph Rosenthal, who I, um, he was my teacher for probably from eighth grade till I graduated high school. And he was a great influence too, and a, a real uh, wonderful help and role model also. And was that something your dad had encouraged or did you do this on your own? My dad encouraged it because actually when he was a kid, he went to the Museum of Fine Arts um, after school classes too. And so they, I think his were on Wednesday afternoons or something, but the ones I went to were on Saturday mornings. And, and then when I was a senior, I, for the spring semester, I went all day morning and afternoon. Are they still doing that? I believe they are, yes. Yeah. yeah. And that was great, too, because I'd walked through the museum and I just looked at all these paintings. And the ones that I was really um, taken with were the Hudson River School painters and the luminous painters and such. They had a wonderful collection of 19th century landscapes. So and, for those people who are listening who might not yet know your work, um, w- would you explain to them what it is you do? Uh, well, superficially, I paint landscapes, but there's, there's sort of a deeper level of, of what I'm trying to do. And um, without getting too bogged down in it, I'm, I'm trying to understand, you know, what is the nature of reality? What is this world that we live in? What's the universe that we live in? Where does man fit in and all that? And for me, the best way to explore that is through studying nature and um, interpreting it and really meditating on what I am looking at and experiencing when I'm out of doors in this universe that is such an amazing place. And it's, um, I'm really enthralled with physics because that helps us understand mechanically what's happening to the universe and also sort of the spiritual aspect of it. convinced that there is on some level some type of a spiritual component to our existence. So and what, so when I'm painting, say, a rock, I'm looking at that rock and I'm thinking, well, that rock is as valid as any other place in the universe. It's just an amazing piece of a hunk of matter is, you know, what's inside of a black hole or, you know, this galaxy far, far away, this rock I'm painting on in this planet Earth is, you know, an amazing um, material and it's made up of all these tiny different particles and we still don't even know what the tiniest particle is you know some people think it's vibrating strings and so it's a in a way it's a way to contemplate um sort of the meaning of life you know but it's sort of a roundabout way i guess if you were to joe uh, it's just a rock (laughs) right just a rock (laughs) but i i for me, that's the intriguing thing when I'm painting. It's it's more than just painting a pretty scene. Um, but then on the practical level, I'm also trying to make a painting that has you know a composition and it's interesting to look at. And there might be some little fascinating aspect of the light that I'm really focusing on. So it's it really functions on a lot of different levels. You know, that there's the sort of the deeper meaning that's really important for me and kind of keeps me sustained because if I were just painting sort of pretty pictures of rivers going through mountains or something like that, after a while I would get kind of bored. Right. So, so this allows me to um, explore, you know, this interest I have. There's a couple of theories out there uh, depending on who you talk to. So there are the, the plein air purists. A plein air purist is a person who says, I have to finish the painting. I started on location 
in the exact light, whether it's one session or multiple sessions. Um, the, and, I, and I paint exactly what I see. Um, I don't move trees. I don't shift things around for composition. I just look for the great composition and I paint it. And then there are others who move things around and there are others who will take them back and then work on them in the studio and then maybe even translate them into larger paintings. What's your theory on this? Well, I, I give a lot of presentations, and I always preface it by saying that every artist is somewhat of an egotist because we all think that the way we're doing it is the best way for us to do it. Because you would be silly if you were doing it your way, but you knew there was a better way out there. So we always gravitate towards what we think is the best method. And so with art, especially where it's somewhat of an elusive um, thing, it's there's no really right answer or no wrong answer. So whenever I say, you know, this is what I do, I always want people to remember that I'm saying, for me, this is the best way to do it. Right. Because someone else may have another way, but their goals are different than mine. So I can't apply my sort of methods to their goals because, you know, everyone has their own individual way of approaching art. So for me, uh, generally speaking, I try to paint what I see. I don't move things around too much in the landscape, unless there's something really obvious that just isn't working. But there are other features of the scene that I like. And when I'm painting, I'm not really thinking, oh, I have to make a finished landscape in the field. Sometimes that happens. But I'm really looking for information. And it's a way for me to study nature and how it is sort of the nuts and bolts of how it's put together. Um, and then I can take that information I have and bring it back to the studio and make a painting from the what I've gathered in the field. So oftentimes the plein air painting isn't really the goal. The goal is to make a studio painting back in the studio. But sometimes the painting comes out fine as a plein air painting. And I said, well, great, I'll keep that or I'll sell it, I'll put it in the market or whatever. And oftentimes I look at it and I say, it's not a very good composition, but I really love the, the light that I was able to capture in this and the way I was able to understand this, you know, maybe the, the rocky formation that I'm painting. Photographs? So, Do you use photographs at all? No, no, I don't. And I know there are some artists that use photographs and that's fine. For me, um, what I'm looking for, I wouldn't get in a photograph because I can draw things well enough and my sense of color is, is um, acute enough, I guess, that I don't need a photograph. It really wouldn't bring anything to the painting that I can't paint on location. So there's a, there, you're painting a location and all of a sudden a herd of deer come running across and you go, oh man, I can't possibly draw all 30 of them at once. Will you snap a photograph? No, no. <laughs> um, I'll look at the deer and I'll appreciate the herd of deer that ran by and go on painting. You know, <laughs> everything doesn't have to be painted, I guess. Right. And if you see something that's just so amazing, sometimes you just appreciate for the beauty of what you've seen. If, you know, if it's a sunset that lasts for three minutes, then I'll just sit there and look at it and, and appreciate it. But also when I'm looking at it and appreciating it, I'm studying it and analyzing it and trying to remember it. So I can use that in a later painting too. Uh -huh. I'll probably maybe 60% or 70% of my paintings in the studio are completely made up because I've been doing this for so long and so desperately observing nature. And because I don't have a camera, I have to be desperate <laughs> and observe it really intently that I've sort of developed this storehouse of knowledge in my mind about how the different parts of nature fit together. So do you carry a sketchbook with you um, at all times or do you do a thumbnail sketch before you begin? Um, Sometimes I'll do a thumbnail sketch or I'll do a brown and white underpainting. Just oftentimes I'm not quite sure if the scene that I've chosen is going to work out very well. And so if I do an underpainting, that gets me the composition and the values somewhat where they're going to be. And by then I know whether the painting's worth pursuing. So um, I, I know there are a lot of people out here at different levels. There are people who are curious, who have not painted. There are beginning painters. There are experienced professionals listening. Um, can, can you, I, I know people love to talk technique. Um, and I know you're a sight size guy. Is that right? Yes. So 
why don't we start there? Why don't you talk a little bit about site size? And uh, because that that's something I don't think most plein air painters are doing. No. Um, and I'm not sure a lot of people understand what site size is, but maybe you could articulate what you do and what it is. Okay, sure. Um, figure painters are probably familiar with it, but site size painting is a method of our site size drawing actually is a method of drawing and painting that was developed um, through the largely refined in the French Academy in the 19th century, but it's been developing over the centuries. And what happens is if you're painting a figure, you would pick, place your canvas right next to the figure, not in front of you with the figure 10 feet away, but they would be side by side. And you would walk back maybe 10 feet and you would compare the figure to the canvas and you would put a mark where the top of the head is. You'd walk up to the canvas, put a mark where the top of the head is. So if you, if, if you took a string and held a string that uh, in your view covered the, the model and the canvas, the string would go across the top of the head of the model and into the spot on the canvas where you want to put the painting. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. So you'd put a mark where the top of that head is. Then you'd walk back to your viewing spot and make sure it was in the right place. Then you'd walk up and put a mark where the chin is. And then you'd put a mark where the waist is, say. And then all of these points would correspond to the actual figure standing next to the canvas. And then you would go on refining. You'd say, how wide is the head? You'd make the head the exact width that you see it in real life. And so what happens is when you finish your drawing or your painting, you have an image that's exactly the same size as the object that you're painting. They call it site size because the site you see is the size that it is. And it's a very good way to compare the two because when you're scaling things up or down, it's hot. You, first of all, you can't measure straight across and get the same um, distances. If you're making something smaller, everything, all the proportions are going to be slightly smaller. This, all the proportions are all the same. So it's e an easy way to compare the two and make sure that your drawing is accurately drawn. And so what, uh, what happened was I spent a couple of years in Boston studying with Robert Cormier, who was a figure painter. And I learned the site size drawing method with him. And several years after that, I was painting a landscape. And I thought, why don't I sort of inter use some of the things that I've been doing with site size figure painting in the landscape? So now what I do is I have a little frame that's about the, that's the same size as my panel and I'll clamp it on to my panel right next to it. And I'll look through the frame, it's a viewfinder and I'll look at the scene and every shape I see in that viewfinder, I'll transfer onto my panel in the exact same proportions, just as I would if I were doing sight size figure painting. So there is, uh, if, if anyone wants to Google it, if you Google your name and look at images, there's a picture of that frame uh, attached to your easel uh, so that they can kind of get a feel for that. Right. It's easy if you look at it and then try to explain it. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, if you Google my name, you can see that. Also, there's um, on my website, at the, on the plein air section of paintings, there's a, a, um, a painting of a wall that I painted right next, su sort of superimposed on top of the wall. And your website is joemcgirl.com? Yes, joemcgirl.com. josephmcgirl.com. josephmcgirl.com, okay. Yeah. So, so in theory, what should happen is when you do a side size painting or drawing, you can superimpose the thing that you've painted on top of the, the actual image, and it's, it, looks, it will look exactly the same if you're successful. All right. Well, I, I, you're one of the few people that I know that does sight size painting in plein air. What, what would you say are the real advantages? Does it make your job easier? Uh, it makes it quicker. Marc D'Alessio is uh, another big sight size landscape painting aficionado. And um, it makes it much quicker because everything is, as I said, the proportions are all the same. So you're not reinterpreting things. And it's also easier to compare your shapes and your values and your colors because if you flick your eye back and forth between the painting that you've made and the, the scene right next to it, it's easy to see mistakes because you're just going, moving your eye just a couple inches back and forth. And, and are you uh, continually stepping back like you would when working with a model? Yes, but not quite as much because um, I'm trying to 
paint what I see at the same size. When I set step back, then all the proportions change between the viewfinder scene and the actual painting. So, so you, it's kind of like with sight size uh, figure painting, you have to find a spot and you have to go back to that spot every time so you can compare them from the same place. And with uh, landscape painting, it's the same. I have to kind of stand the same in the same spot so I can look through the viewfinder at exactly the same angle and the same distance from it. Right. Okay. Makes a lot of sense. Well, people love to talk about technique. Uh, if somebody were to study under you, what are the core essentials that you really try to hammer into their heads? Um, I, I guess, you know, like everyone, uh, or most teachers, drawing is always the most important um, aspect because if you can't draw it, then everything else is going to look off. And it's, you know, the so drawing is the basic thing. And I think a lot of landscapers, landscape, landscape painters, don't spend enough time drawing. And it's as important to draw a landscape well as it is to draw a figure well. It, with a landscape, you've got to get that progression of planes uh, receding back into space. And it's you're de dealing with very tiny slivers of space that you have to control accurately in order to get that impression that you're painting a great, you know, a great space that's going back, you know, a couple of miles or so. And so the drawing is really important and, you know, drawing trees and getting the branches so they look right and they have, they bend at the right places and such. Um, and if you don't have that, this, the color and the value and shapes and edges and all that stuff aren't going to matter. So I think landscape painters would be really well served if they spent a lot of time figure drawing because the, although I think landscapes are the hardest things to paint, figure drawing is really good for training your eye to copy what you see exactly. And then, you know, once you can do that, you can sort of interpret things. But the first thing you want to do is have complete control. It's like a, a musician being able to play, you know, scales perfectly. That gives them the freedom to um, invent and to sort of go outside of the box. And the same with drawing. Once you can draw perfectly, then that gives you the freedom to, um, do, to draw imperfectly but still give, make a beautiful picture and make beautiful shapes and beautiful design. So I, I'd say the first thing is drawing and then um, after that is value. And how do you, what's your process for helping people learn value? Uh, well, value studies are great, just doing a, a brown and white or a black and white painting because then you don't get confused with color. A lot of times when artists put color in, they can't see that you know this yellow is actually darker than the blue because psychologically we think that yellow is a bright light color and blue is a darker color but you can have very pale blue and a deeper yellow and so by eliminating the color choice then you just have value and you can um, focus on exactly how dark one area of a painting should be and how light another area should be also with value that creates your composition so you're kind of withdrawing and value, you've got your design or your composition um, coming into play also. So composition is obviously a pretty wide topic, but um, are there some particular tips that you can share that um, that you think are essentials? Because, you know, there's, there's kind of this sense of never put something dead center, uh, you know, horizontally or vertically. And yet I've seen a couple paintings of yours where it appears the horizon line of a piece of water or some, some water or something is dead center and it works beautifully. So is there a rule that you typically follow? Um, no. I mean, there again, it's a, one of those deals where like once you kind of know the rules, you can, you can break the rules. And I always heard that same thing and they have the, the golden mean and all that. But if you follow that to it, you know, to, um, too tightly, it, it becomes kind of a predictable and a boring painting. So, um, so a lot of times I like to break the rules. Is a painting I did called Singularity, and it's of a just of a rock, and it's cent centered right on the uh, canvas, and there's about the same amount of border on all four sides. And compositionally, people say, "Well, that's not a very good composition." But the way I painted it, I think it really works well, and it's sort of a balanced. Um, uh, balanced composition and there are ways to break the rules 
and still make an interesting painting. I also did one of a cranberry bog with a the little um, the canal that goes up through the cranberry bog is dead center in the painting. And it, there again, it's a it has a lot of symmetry to the composition, and and I think it works fine. Um, there are some things that are you know hard to do, and you'll you'll see compositions that just don't work. They break the rules, and they also don't work. But it's interesting and fun for me to sort of break the rules and do something a little bit different that, than, you know, the golden mean. Or if you look at um, Edgar Payne's book, uh, Composition of Outdoor Painting, there are all these different devices, but they're kind of formulaic. And so I really don't like to, I don't like to look at those compositions because then I keep looking for that in nature. And I don't feel like I'm inventing things on my own, I guess is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think the big thing really is just finding a beautiful shapes in an interesting design. And one of the best ways to do that is turn your painting upside down and just draw the shapes. A lot of times I'll do that when I'm um, starting a new painting. I'll draw it out and I'll start filling in a value painting underneath. And I'll turn it upside down and I'll paint on it for an hour or two upside down. Every now and then flipping it back just to make sure that spatially that the comp composition in the, in the space and such reads correctly. But um, then I'll turn it back upside down again and just work on the shapes and try to get the shapes so they're beautiful and they also have um, some movement to them and it's somewhat intriguing to the viewer. Hmm. But a you know, very symmetrical composition can be really beautiful and intriguing to the viewer too. So I guess with composition, it's, you know, once again, it's one of those situations where when you know the rules, then you can break them and you know where to break them. You talked a little bit about physics very early on. And there are some physics when it comes to painting water, probably some physics when it comes to painting skies. Do you take that into consideration? Yeah, well, I, I think I understand water and sky, so I understand what I'm looking at. For instance, if I'm looking at water, there's transparency but there's also reflection and it's also a receding plane that goes back in space. And, but it's also has texture. If it's, you know, rough and there's little waves or big waves, there's a lot of texture to it. And there's also movement and motion. So there's all these different features that are acting on the water and you've got to kind of understand them in order to paint them well, particularly where I don't use photography. And also if you're painting, say, you know, a shoreline with waves uh, crashing on the, on the shore, you can't really paint what you see because obviously it doesn't stay still for you. It would be like a figure painter trying to paint somebody who's making all goofy faces continually. But you can understand that when a wave is curling over, part of it is in shadow, part of it has a, a, a kind of a rim light on the top of it, um, and then the plane behind it is oftentimes a flat plane and so on. So I, I guess if you look in terms of the physics of, of water, how the light is hitting it, I would imagine that kind of gives you some clues. Yes, and if you understand what you're looking for, you can look out for that. And every time a wave breaks with the, the same lighting situation, it's going to do the same thing more or less. Um, and so then you can watch for that. And a lot of times when I'm painting the ocean, I'll just stare at the ocean for a real long time, decide what's happening and how I want to portray the wave. And then I'll, I'll paint it. And I won't really look at the ocean much after that because, as I said, it's all moving. So it's not like I can copy what I see. In that sense, you're kind of painting what you know rather than what you see. And the same thing is true for skies, like sunsets in particular, where they happen so quickly. I kind of understand what the clouds are doing when I'm looking at them. So I can use a lot of improvisation and kind of make up what I'm seeing. I'm basing it on the sky that I'm seeing, but I'm also using a lot of improvisation because a lot of times, you know, the cloud shapes aren't very beautiful. They're awkward and clumsy or um, not as interesting as they could be. So I can add or subtract or alter things to what I'm seeing to make it into a, a better a better painting, but still basing it on what I'm seeing. Otherwise, why am I standing out there painting this sunset? So, but as I said before, oftentimes I, I do like to stick pretty closely to what I'm seeing without putting too much um, sort of my personal stamp on it, particularly in the field. How much do you, do you paint outdoors in the field? Uh, it really varies. Uh, not as much as I would like to. 
Um, but I'll go on a painting trip for a week or two weeks and I'll paint outdoors you know, every day and then I'll be in the studio for a month and won't paint outdoors at all. And then I might get out for a day or two here or there. But lately it's been a lot more of sort of these organized trips that I've been um, going on with like the Plain Air Painters of America. Um, and that's when I do a lot of my outdoor painting these days. So I'm usually kind of a solitary painter. I like to sort of go off in the corner and be, get really quiet and sort of almost meditative as far as what I'm seeing and trying to reinterpret and paint. There are some painters I know when they're out there and they're talking and they're laughing and yucking it up and all that. And I just can't do that because I can't concentrate well enough. Yeah. Been there, done that. Um, it's very hard to concentrate. It's fun. It's fun to be with other painters, but there's a time when you just have to kind of stick to it and hush, yeah, so to speak. What, what do you think in terms of um, if, if you sit down at a workshop and you, you're talking to the people um, that are studying with you? I notice you have a sold-out workshop coming up in September. Um, are, are there things that you talk to them about in terms of how to create that sense of emotion in your paintings or things that you talk to them about, you know, how they can develop their careers or how they can develop, you know, get to the next level as a painter. Are there any, any pieces of advice that you typically give? Um, well, one thing that I've been thinking more and more about and talking more and more about is sort of being authentic to what you're, you're painting. And I think you have to paint who you are and what you think about, and you kind of paint your life. And I think, by doing that, you have you you create a much deeper piece of artwork. Um, there are a lot of painters that you know. Oh, I should paint sailboats because sailboats sell, or I should paint cowboys because cowboys sell and stuff. But unless you're a sailor or a cowboy, it's hard to lend that authenticity to the scene that you're painting. Right. Um, I mean, you could put little tiny sailboats in the background, or I have some paintings where I put little tiny cowboys in the background. But I couldn't paint a you know a, a scene with prominent cowboys because I'm not a cowboy. And for me, there again, this is my own personal opinion, which doesn't necessarily agree with everyone else's. But for me, I have to kind of live the things that I'm painting. And for me, landscapes are really important. And most things that I do in, in my leisure time still relate back to interacting with the landscape. I, I go trail running on uh, this beach that goes along this island or there's another trail that goes through the woods around a pond and the whole time I'm running I'm looking at this beautiful landscape and looking at trees and kind of thinking about how I would use them in paintings um, I, we have a sailboat I do a lot of sailing and there again it's a way to interact with nature on a you know a really deep and profound level and skiing at, you know in the middle of the winter I can be at the top of a mountain and it's 10 degrees out and you know, I spend a day there again, interacting with the landscape. And um, so I enjoy a lot of outdoor activities. And I think it's largely because I love nature and the landscape so much. And it helps me to understand it on a different level. So I, th I think that, you know, one of the biggest things artists can do is sort of find their authenticity and paint things that they know and they believe in and that relate to their life and somehow and they'll get a much deeper more profound result than sort of painting what they think the, the market is looking for at that time so you you uh appear to be very successful in terms of uh it, it appears that you've got great gallery representation and you're selling well um one never knows, but it, it, that's the appearance yeah. that we, we have. And so with that in mind, um, were you deliberate in building your career or were you one of these guys where you build it and they will come? Uh, I guess it just happened and I was kind of shocked. <laughs> when, when I got out of college, you know, I, I went to college and I was a dual major, education and painting, because everyone in college told me, oh, you can never make a living as an artist. So... Being an art teacher was my backup plan. And I taught six months of junior high, and I didn't like it at all. Yeah. And at the end of the year, I, I took over for a teacher I'd left. At the end of the year, I said, well, this isn't going to really work. So then I, uh, I got a, a yacht captain's license. I've you know, always been a sailor. and I was a yacht ca 
captain for a few years. And then at the end of that, I realized I really wanted to paint. I was still painting a little bit when I was doing the, the sailing thing. And so I, that's when I sought out Bob Cormier, who was um, the Boston School painter, and I studied figure drawing under him. And it really transformed my art because when I was at Mass College of Art, I never really had a good drawing course. And the art that they produced was sort of all the conceptual and abstract things. And I, I didn't feel I got what I needed. But with Bob Cormier, he taught me, you know, that you can be really careful about your artwork and it's very precious and your drawing can be exact rather than sort of the expressive things that they were um, promoting at Mass College of Art. And that really turned my, my thinking around and my painting around, really. And I remember being at a, a museum and seeing a George Innes painting and thinking, if I could paint like that, I know people would buy paintings. Because in those days, you know, everyone was saying, oh, you can't make a living as an artist. So anyway, I sort of refocused myself and quit the yacht captaining thing and tried to paint better. And the better I painted, I started selling some paintings. And the more I sold, the more time I could spend painting. And eventually I was, you know, painting full time and selling a lot of paintings. And it just sort of happened organic. I didn't even realize it. And I kept sort of amazing myself that like, wow, all these paintings sold and now I'm actually making a living as an artist. And I had a few dealers that were really good in those days. Um, Al Walker, who was a, a dealer in Boston, he, he uh, bought several of my paintings and resold them at his gallery. And Julian Baird, who was the original owner of Tree's Place, it's been sold a couple of times since he owned it. But when he um, started out, he was a wonderful dealer and a, a really great um, friend and he had a, a wonderful sense of promotion and enthusiasm and so it just sort of happened I didn't really plan on any of it and this was before the internet or anything so basically in those days I'd do a painting I'd send it to the gallery and they would sell it and I didn't have to worry about Facebook or um, maintaining a website and and all that it was really all the dealers that did all the selling it was kind of nice because <laughs> I could spend so much more time painting them than doing some of the marketing that artists have to do these days. And I didn't have to photograph my own work. I do that now. Um, the galleries would do all that. Now, what galleries are you in today? Um, Cavalier Gallery in New York, John Pence in San Francisco, um, Collins Galleries here on Cape Cod, uh, Palm Avenue Fine Art in Sarasota, Florida, Helena Fox in Charleston, um, dealing with a, um, an artist representative in China, Stephen Ling. I just started with him, and it seems like it's going really well. Um, and Haynes Gallery in Thomaston, Maine. So I have a lot more galleries than I used to. In the old days, I had really three main galleries, and kind of um, Tree's Place and Hammer Gallery in New York were, for several years were my main galleries. And then 2008, Hammer closed, and then Trees eventually got sold, and so that's where I first saw your artwork was in Hammer Gallery. There was a show upstairs uh, at Hammer. Yeah, that, that was a, a terrific gallery. And that was one of those nice old school galleries where they really, you know, they only had maybe 22 or 24 artists and they knew us really well and, you know, treated the artists really well. And um, they would give me a stipend every month. I'd get a check. So when we had a show. Um, then we'd settle up at the end of the show, but it, you know, kept me going a uh, year round. So we'd have sort of a dependable source of income. Yeah. That was a, a wonderful gallery. It, w it was Howard, right? Howard ran that Howard. Uh, Kent yeah. Howard Shaw was the, oh, yeah. manager, uh, the gallery manager. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it was, it was great. You know, they kept encouraging me to be just, have just one gallery. It said, you know, in the old days, artists would have one gallery and they'd stick with that gallery for years and years. But, I used to say, well, what happens if you guys close? And well, that's enough? right, and they did. <laughs> and, and well, you know, you have you, if, if you have all your eggs in one basket, especially these days. You know, pre ninety eight, things were a lot different. Things were just you know flying off the walls, and it's it's a lot harder now. And I think part of what happens is that um, there there's kind of like a perfect storm, right? We had the economic thing happen, but we also had the internet thing happen, and so. Uh, the galleries that survive tend to be the ones who are doing things differently. They're not just waiting for people to walk in the door. And uh, that that seems to make a big difference. And, of course, artists have to promote now. And 
makes a huge difference. Yeah, I, I think you know we've we've done a wonderful job of like building up this representational art movement among the practitioners. There's ateliers all over the country. There's planner events and everything, but we've done a terrible job of bringing the general public along. Yeah, and well, that's so I consider that my one of my top missions is to try to figure out ways to do that because more more people exposed uh, is going to make a big difference for all of us. Right. I actually because, have something I'm going to announce soon, and so you, you'll uh, I think that'll you'll be pleased when you hear about it. Oh, that'd be great because it seems like there's a disconnect between us and the general public, and we're sort of an inbred circle. Um, like on Facebook, most of my Facebook friends are other artists. Yeah. Well, you know, I know you have some interesting theories on the art market and how the art market works. I don't know if you want to talk about that publicly. I remember you doing a presentation in a bedroom upstairs when we were all together in, I don't remember where we were, um, Maine. Up in Maine, and, yeah. and you had this interesting presentation, some theories on how you thought the art world was working. I don't know if you want to touch on that or you want to leave it alone. Well, I guess basically I was talking about the contemporary art market and the ridiculous prices that are being paid for these different artworks and such and how you know, people always try to say, I don't understand that art and why are they buying that? And they don't understand that it's all about the money. And if that art wasn't being sold for $50 million, there wouldn't be nearly the interest in it. And it's kind of funny because the they sort of promote it as contemporary art and things that are happening in the world today and how it relates to, you know, humanity. But it's really supported by this tiny, tiny group of incredibly wealthy investors. They're not really, by and large, art appreciators. They're investors, and they buy it for the investment potential. And so the money has really corrupted the, the art establishment. And it's this kind of a really wide-ranging web that goes from you know galleries to auction houses and critics and museums and this um, group of inside collectors and they're making billions of dollars off of it well and and i think i think we have to be careful what we ask for too you know we, we you know there are a lot of artists who are like well why aren't we getting the hundreds of millions of dollars for our paintings and it, it, you know that that has become in my opinion a bit of a machine and you know the, the you look at some of these very wildly successful contemporary artists and they have factories of people who are just churning things out for them they come up with concepts and they're churning them out and they are making a lot of money there's no doubt about it but i wonder if you know we get embraced by that sector then does that turn us into a machine you know is it gonna because the, the nature of what you do is relatively slow and, and articulate and not something that can be um, uh, produced in a factory unless you're doing prints. Right, and that's why we, it probably won't happen to us because with us, the value of the art is judged by the quality. And with the this sort of contemporary art market that's out there, the value of the art is judged by how much someone will pay for it. That's right. And you can sort of manipulate the market in all these ways that they do it, you know, between auction houses and um, secret buyers and such, to get the pricing structure that you want. But with what we do, it's if you have five paintings lined up on a wall, most people can find the best one and the worst one, and they'll pay more money for the best one. And so it's ours has a, a standard that it can be judged by, but a lot of this abstract conceptual stuff doesn't really have a standard. It's kind of what appeals to the whim of this group of insiders and who they decide that they're going to anoint as the next wonderkind and promote him. And um, so it probably won't happen to us. And you're right that we probably don't. Well, I definitely don't want that. I'd like, to, you know, I'd like a little more focus on what we do because we're totally ignored by the establishment. But um, I don't think I want to go the route that that they've gone where this this huge money machine is just churning out this stuff like crazy. Wouldn't um, hurt to have a little of it though. A little bit, yeah. <laughs> well, everything in moderation, you know. <laughs> so what is the uh the painting that you haven't done yet that you want to do? Um well if I knew I'd be doing it right now. <laughs> okay. I like I that. A That's project. a good good answer. I do have a project that I'd like to work on, and once I clear the decks of this, I have several um, 
paintings underway for different um, venues. But once I get that finished, I'd like to go out to Boston Harbor where I grew up and do a series of paintings on the islands in Boston Harbor, which I think are one of the most beautiful places in the world. Uh, probably largely because I have such a personal connection to them, but even right. just, you know, sort of non-objectively, they're, um, or objectively, they're really a, a beautiful place and with a lot of different uh, unique topography and shorelines and, you know, rocky beaches, sandy beaches, marshes, headlands, just beautiful place. So I'd like to do a series of paintings on the islands of, of Boston Harbor. So I think you just answered this next question, but if if I if I said, look, it's your you know, your, your last week and you can go anywhere in the world and do, um, a series of paintings on that place. Would that be Boston Harbor? Or would it be someplace else? Uh, right now it would be a toss up between Boston Harbor and Italy. Ah, you've got some beautiful Italian paintings on, on your website. Yeah. The, the, I think those are probably two of my most favorite places in the world. Um, yeah. you know, they, they have sort of a nice, I have a personal connection to them because I've spent so much time there, but just the physicality of them, they're, they're just, I think they're just beautiful. So before we wrap up, um, I've got one final question, but before we do that, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about or add to this conversation? Not, I think we did a pretty good job of covering things from sort of the, you know, what I do workshop wise and such, but I guess I just will maybe reiterate again that, you know, the importance of being authentic with your work and also not following other people's rules, making your own rules, but have them sort of grounded in a little bit of um, truth. In other words, as I was thinking about this the other day that I had a discussion with an artist friend of mine about keeping certain areas. I think CW was talking about this, too keeping certain areas of your canvas out of focus because that's the way the eye sees. Do you and do that? No, because I disagree with that. Okay. That's what, yeah, I was just going to say, it looks like everything in your paintings are in focus. Right. Because wherever your eye lands, everything else will automatically be out of focus. So if you have say a figure and that's the center of interest in your painting, if you paint everything at the same degree of finish, when you look at that figure, everything outside of the area of that figure will be out of focus because that's we can't see beyond a few inches away. So if you're reading a book, for instance, read a word on one page, you can't see any words on the other page. It's just a blur. So if you paint that figure in focus and you paint everything else outside of that figure blurry, it'll be doubly blurred because when you look in the figure, you're looking at a blurred painting. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yeah. But if you paint that figure in focus and everything else outside of the figure in focus too, when you look at that figure, everything outside of that will already be in focus. I mean, will be blurry. So it's sort of like you're double blurring it you're, when you paint things that aren't at the center of interest and focus. Now, that's just my opinion. Isn't but that... But for artists to do a wonderful job of painting the figure in focus and everything outside of the center of interest, that figure uh, blurry. So I think it's really important for artists to sort of, there again, find their own unique way of painting and of doing things and always striving to, you know, think about what you're doing and why you're doing it and question the, the things that you've been told. Like I was always told never use black. And for 20 years, I didn't use black. And now I use black all the time. I love it. It's a wonderful color. Well, the, I, the, I would imagine it's, it's, it's all about control because the tendency when you first use black is to overuse it and it tends to dominate. And so it's probably more about learning how to use black. Yes, that's exactly right. It's learning how to use black. Um, you can use black badly. And when you look at the painting and say, wow, that's really gray and chalky looking. Because the artist didn't know how to use black, but you know, a blanket statement like "never use black." Well, um, I, I I remember one time uh, I was with uh, Nikolai Dubovik, who's a instructor at the Serikov Institute in Moscow at the Russian Academy, and I said, "What rules do you teach your students?" He said, "There are no rules." Yeah, exactly. Well, even like the limited um, value range or some artists to say, well, you have a limited value range because you don't want to use a range that goes from black to white. Um, you know, it's like playing in, in a certain key on a piano. 
But my view is that we already have a limited value range because when I'm outside painting, I don't have any white that's nearly as bright as the sun as sunshine. Right. And I don't have any dark that's nearly as dark as a deep shadow under a bush. So we're already playing in a limited value range. So in almost all my paintings, I have something really very light, almost pure white, and something very dark, almost black, or even black. Now, do you have and any... again, artists make beautiful paintings with limited value ranges. So do... there's no real rule. You know, there's no... You have to find out what's right for you and what works for you. And don't sort of mindlessly adhere to these rules like I did for so long, not using black. Do you have Do you have a mindless rule about shadows? Like, you know, warm light, cool shadows kind of thing? Uh, I used to. My shadows were always cool. My lights were always warm. And then I kept looking and saying, but that shadow's warm. There are times there again that the rules are always broken. But, you know, generally speaking, if you look at a lot of my paintings, the shadows tend to be cool. And if you look at 19th century landscapes, the shadows tend to be warm. And they're kind of both right. right. And if you look at the Impressionists, the shadows are blue. <laughs> right. Well, it's, it's about observation and it's about what you're trying to communicate ultimately, I guess, isn't it? Right. Right. And it's sort of your you know, your personal vision. And as I said in the beginning, you know, every artist thinks what they're doing is right, right because it's right for them. I think the mistake that artists do is when they try to make a blanket statement. So you should never do this. You should never do that. And with me, it's always from me. I never do this. Or, but So I, I have, a, I I have a couple of favorite questions. Um, one is you can go back and get an hour or a lunch or a dinner with any artist in history who is that artist and what would you ask them? Hmm. It might be, well, maybe Andrew Wyeth and mostly Andrew Wyeth because he had such a profound effect on me when I was sort of at that 15, 16 year old age. Uh, we got this book. For, we, I saw the show in Boston he had at the Museum of Fine Arts. And then we got this book, um, uh, a very big, I can't remember the name of it, but it was Andrew Wyeth's book. It was sort of his major book that was, it was printed in 1968 or so. And I just spent forever poring over that. And I would probably ask him, I think it would be more philosophical, like, did you believe what you painted? Because it seemed like he did. Sort of this lonely little scariness. And where did you get your ideas? And if you're looking at this barn, it looks like an average barn to me. How do you turn it into this sort of mysterious, spooky place that, you know, you might be afraid to enter? Or do you consciously do that? Or does it just come out? And is it just the way that your, your thinking is so powerful that it just sort of translates into, what, into the imagery that you make? Because I, one of the big mistakes people make about Andrew Wyeth is they think he's so cute and nostalgic. And to me, he's kind of spooky and scary. <laughs> Um, you know, his, there's just great sense of mystery to his paintings right. and um, loneliness, kind of. And it's also interesting because he did so many people, but people think that he wasn't a people person. But I always think he probably was very gregarious because you couldn't spend that much time painting somebody without interacting with them on a, a really personal level. Well, if you go back into the podcast um, where I interviewed Steve Doherty, he tells some stories about meeting and spending time with Wyeth. Yes, and, I heard that one. That'd be one worth listening to. And one of these days I'm going to get to Jamie and get Jamie on the podcast and we'll, we'll ask him that question. Well, I, I, I was scheming how to meet them because I stayed in Jamie's house in Monhegan for a few days several years ago. And this is when Andrew was still alive. And I was trying to figure out maybe if I sort of blocked up the toilet, they'd have to come out and fix it. <laughs> Well, that's right. They live on the little island right next to Monhegan, right? The family. Yeah. Betsy does, I believe. Yeah. 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 Well, maybe he's listening and he'll give you a call. Yeah. <laughs> Jamie Wyatt's work is just spectacular, too. I, I'm really, really taken with his work. So, And he has that authenticity about him. and He doesn't really follow the rules, but he knows what the rules are. Yeah, well, he had he had the um, the opportunity like you to grow up with it, and um, that doesn't necessarily mean it doesn't guarantee anything. It means that he listened and paid attention, and then kind of found his own voice. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So uh, the big question: It's your final day on Earth. Every painting you ever created 
has disappeared. There's no record of anything that you've done anywhere. You've got your closest friends and family gathered around you for your last breath. And before you utter your last breath, you can whisper three truths. They could be truths about life. They could be truths about painting. Um, what are those three truths? Uh, I guess one is nothing stays the same. So appreciate what you've got while you have it. Um, Boy, that's so true. You know, my kids are growing and gone. One's in, one just, my youngest son just graduated from college. My oldest son graduated a couple of years. And they, I see them often enough, but it's not like it was when they were little and they were at the house all the time. And where I worked at home, you know, it was just always, I was always with them. And it's, it's a hard adjustment. I guess it's that empty nest syndrome. You don't realize it. And I keep thinking I have two little kids running in the studio. Right. And so it sort of slips away, you know, faster than you, you realize it. So I guess that's one thing. Um, another truth would be, uh, I guess, do what you, what you want to do and do it with a passion and have faith in yourself. And I think that's, when I was in college, I was really depressed because I thought I'd never be a successful artist. I had no idea what I was going to do. And, um, I wish I hadn't wasted all that time worrying about it because uh, everything worked out really amazingly well. And I've been incredibly fortunate to do what I love for you know my entire adult life, just about. And with my youngest son, when we encouraged him to go into music, I, I said, you should do it because you don't want to regret it later. I have so many people come up to him and say, oh, I wish I had gone into art, but I was afraid I couldn't make a living at it. So, you know, he became a doctor or something like that. But um, I would rather live with the regret that I tried, or live with the, the knowledge that I tried it and it didn't work than the regret that I never tried it and I wish I had and maybe it would have worked. And one more truth, um, I guess just try to go through life happy, optimistic, friendly. Um, don't make enemies because it's not a fun way to go through life. Just be happy and love your neighbor and your friends and keep, keep in touch with your friends. I just had uh, lunch the other yesterday with a, this old friend of mine that I hadn't seen in several years. And I really missed our company together. We had a great lunch and it was a lot of fun. So I guess those would be the three things. Excellent. Well, I thank you for your time today. I think this has been very insightful and we really appreciate it. Thanks, Eric. It was fun talking to you, and I hope the audience enjoyed it also. Well, thanks again to Joseph McGurl, one of the great artists of all time. The man is absolutely a stunning, amazing painter. Really nice guy, too. Very giving. Uh, this interview was sponsored by easelbrushclip.com. It is a cool tool. Everybody's picking them up for their easels, and they're using them now to attach umbrellas to stabilize them, too. Watch the video at www.easelbrushclip.com. Well, this has been brought to you by the Plein Air Convention, the world's largest gathering of outdoor painters from beginners to pros. And you can learn from the world's top artists and spend a week painting what you learn. We have an optional pre-convention workshop with Quang Ho, which will be amazing, and a beginner's basics course, too, for brand new baby Plein Air painters. We want more of you around. And, of course, some of the faculty, we've got a lot, a lot of faculty. I'm just going to mention a couple names here. James Gurney. Jeremy Lipking, Jill Carver, Kate Starling, Rose Sherling from Holland, Michael Godfrey, Ryan Brown, many, 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 many others. And it's held in San Diego this coming April. It's going to be amazing. Lots of beautiful places to paint. Uh, go and find out more at plenairconvention.com. P-L-E-I-N-A-I-R. Plenairconvention.com from Plein Air Magazine. Well, the plein air movement is hot, and the magazine, as a result, is hot. That's the number one selling magazine at Barnes & Noble nationwide for the art category of representational art. So pick it up and get a subscription at pleinairmagazine.com. Well, it's always fun doing this for an old radio guy like me. Let's do it again sometime, like next week. We'll see you then. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher and founder of Plein Air Magazine. Remember, it's a big world out there. Go paint it. We'll see you. Bye-bye.